Good evening. Uh, this is Camila. Uh, I am a member of the network called mindbodyspirit.com.pl. Uh, we've recently started with our English version of our project. And uh, uh, generally, we organize uh, interviews with different experts uh, talking about um, the mind, body, and spirit connection. We also uh, share podcasts, uh, video interviews, courses, webinars. You can also follow us on Facebook and uh, on Instagram. Uh, and uh, today we have a special guest, Dr. Michelle Lamasa Schrader with us, who is a recall healing specialist. Uh, she has a PhD in mind-body medicine. Uh, she has uh, lots of trainings in German new medicine, in uh, neuroemotional technique hypnosis, coaching, so, so she's so definitely a well-educated person and an expert. Uh, and today we invited Michelle. Uh, you had a chance to meet her actually in uh, October when we organized the screening of the movie Emotion in which Michelle had participated. So we, that was the chance to meet her for the first time. We made a short interview, which is available on our YouTube. Uh, and now we have held her for a full webinar and uh, we've decided that today uh, Dr. Michelle is going to talk about the foundation of recall healing, uh, about uh, the roots of the disease, about how uh, the, your conscious and subconscious mind functions on the example of the iceberg. Uh, then we're going to talk about some real life stories from Michelle's experience as a recall healing specialist. Uh, and so finally, uh, we're going to have a brief discussion on brain issues, brain cancer. And then there will be time for your questions, which you can write on the chat window. And then I can translate them. If they're in Polish, I can translate them for Michelle and uh, She'll answer them for you. So uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm giving my voice to Michelle now. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for, for having me here with you. And I'm always very honored to be able to, to share the things that I have learned. And uh, I always like to say that I, I am on this journey as well. And so it's been because I have applied these tools to my life that I speak with such passion about recall healing and about the emotional roots to that, that cause disease and, and illness. And um, I still have people tell me all the time, you know, does this really, does this emotion really, emotion, even as recently as yesterday, someone said, emotions, really? They don't make any difference. Well, actually, they make all of the difference because any time, think about any time you have an emotion, a feeling, hurt, or somebody said something not very nice about you, or the things that, you know, in your everyday life, you're worried about your kids. So this starts this process in our head, in our mind, that, that creates neural pathways. And every time you speak these things, you, you begin to understand uh, that what fires together, wires together. And, and that your brain will help you to stay alive. It is the purpose of the brain. That's all. So we can talk about religion and these kinds of things, but underneath that is biology. And that it, it doesn't go against the creator, okay? But it works as a system. And we have to pay attention to all of these things. And so I'm delighted to be here with you and to share the, a little bit about recall healing. It's a lot more than just an hour and a half. However, mm -hmm. I'm going to try to do just a little uh, introduction about it and, and how I work with people and handle things. It's simple tools but it's not easy work. It's, it can be very painful. And especially when somebody has gone through a lot. 
I frequently have the experience of, of getting to speak at different conferences. And it's quite interesting that so often that when I come to speak at a conference, many of the doctors scurry out as fast as they can. They don't, they don't want me to, to talk to them or they don't believe it still. But, you know, the indigenous peoples of the world knew that emotions absolutely play a role, if not cause the, the issue. And so um, a little bit about myself, you know, I, I'm Michelle, I have, I have three boys, uh, all, all growing and, and adult, two of them are, are uh, have families of their own with, and I have grandbabies, I have uh, another one on the way. So I'll have six grandbabies at the end of this year. <laughs> so uh, it's sort of fun. So, so my family gives me a lot of experience to be able to speak about these things because I apply them all the time. You know, my youngest son is, is in his second year of college and is going off to uh, Ireland and study. So, but uh, even in, as recently as this year, as I see the struggles of my children, I begin to apply them to my life to be able to see how can I help them? How can I remove some of the things that I had to deal with so they don't have to deal with that? Some of the, the pain that I've experienced in my life. And so that's really so much of my purpose. I love working with parents because, and even grandparents because they, uh, they want to help their kids. And we have a power. So mamas and daddies and, you know, even if, if, if we all have family, even if you're alone, you still have potential to help in your world. And I say that love heals all because if we use love to really love a person in their woundedness, that will really heal the whole situation. And, uh, and sometimes people don't deserve forgiveness, but we do. And so that opens up a whole different thing. And so we'll talk a little bit about that as well, because it's really an important uh, aspect that we, and all the great spiritual masters speak of this, you know, and, and um, the importance of forgiveness. So, so that's a little bit about myself and personally, um, I'm living in Texas now, which is a new thing for me. I moved uh, about nine months ago. And so it's been, I was born and raised in California, and, um, and so that, it's been an interesting adjustment. I went to, to Saybrook University for my PhD. I had gone to Walden University for my master's in psychology. And when I was going through the program for my psychology degree, I began to understand that there was a lot of amazing theories. And yet, many people would go to therapy, traditional therapy, for years and years and years and never have any kind of real transformation. And so when my aunt had a breast cancer, my cousin was looking for some, some, an avenue to help support that. And we, we talked about stress because we would hear stress causes this, stress causes that. Well, it's stress specific specific stress. If I am stressing about my husband being with another person, that's very different than my coworker trying to backstab me. And yet there might be some similar feelings. And so how does it land in my body? It's all about the felt experience. And so when we begin to look at these things, we begin to have some more insight. And so my aunt healed of a breast cancer. Uh, and, and it was pretty amazing. We found this work with Dr. Gilbert Renel. And he came to San Diego and we, and, and it was like, that was it for me. I said, okay, this is the most amazing thing. And I, and I was halfway done with my master's in psychology. And then I began to look for a program that would really uh, honor the mind body connection. And when I found Saybrook, it was the perfect fit because I, the way I envision it is that recall healing is the seed. For me, it's the very foundation. It gives me the, the very basic tools to help my, myself, my family, my friends, and get to walk with people through this process. And then everything that I learned at Saybrook, sort of the things that you were talking about, hypnosis and coaching and, and food as medicine and movement, spirituality, meditation, all of these things contribute to that person's healing and will allow the person to go forward. 
my goal was to always have something in my pocket that I could help somebody if I was sitting next to them on the plane or if there was somebody that I was talking to in a line and they, they mentioned that they might have something. I always want to be able to give that person a tool to be able to help them. And then you can lead the horse to water, but you can't make them drink. So it's really up to that person. And, and along this journey, I began to discover that, that everybody does have that internal wisdom and that oftentimes we as practitioners are planting seeds that maybe they don't pick it up right in that moment, but maybe somebody else gets to water that seed and, and allow it to grow. But if I can give a basic understanding and, and a person goes away, even if they've only had one session or one experience, my goal is that they begin to change their perspective in other things in their life. And so Saybrook helped with that, Dr. Gilbert, and then getting to walk with him through, you know, growing recall healing internationally. You know, I got to go to Poland in, in the fall and that was so amazing. And, and the people are so wonderful. I just, I loved being in Poland. So, and I'll get to go to Russia and, and Ukraine coming next year. So it's quite something, the journey that, that this has, has brought for me. So, so let's jump in and, and let's talk about recall healing. What is our foundation? So um, if you want to pull up the, the, just, I have some, so I, sort of a handout that I give to people when I begin to work with them. And so I want you to, you guys to be able to see this. And so we're going to talk about, about the foundation. What is recall healing rooted in? And the first thing that we have is uh, Dr. Homer's work. And Dr. Homer uh, was a German internist that had developed a really amazing surgical tool and had gone to, to Italy and his son was, was accidentally shot. And about, he spent three months dying of his wounds in the hospital. And, and he literally di died in Dr. Homer's arms. And so about six months after that, Dr. Homer developed testicular cancer. And so he began to hypothesize, look, I do what I'm supposed to do. I eat well, I, I sleep, I exercise, I, I have a spiritual practice. I do the things that, that are supposed to allow me to, to heal. And so, so he went back to Germany and it was at the time that CAT scans were, were first starting to come out. And he began to, to discover that there was little marks. If a person had uh, been, di if people that had been diagnosed with the similar types of issues in their body would have these similar types of marks in their brain. And sort of like a bullseye where there's a, one dot with concentric rings around it. It's almost like in, uh, I use California language, but it's almost like an earthquake where there's a tremor there or an earthquake where there's a, there, there's a lot of energy in that particular place that, and then the shock will be felt outward. And however big the, the shock is, is how big that that download can be. So, so it could be, you can envision like a, a lightning bolt or, or this earthquake or, you know, something, but there's a shock that happens. Dr. Hammer received the news about his son. <gasps> That's a big shock. Oh my gosh. You know, and I'm a doctor. How am I going to help my son to heal? And so, so he began to develop this whole system of thinking and he had, there were five laws that came from his work. And so we use these laws as a foundation to help us to understand and we, we really like to have the diagnosis because sometimes, in, and I'll give you an example later, sometimes you, you think that you're dealing with one thing, but it's actually something completely different based on this system. Our body is a system. And so when we look at this, this system, we have to pay attention to it. So for instance, we, my grandson was diagnosed with a brain tumor a couple of years ago. And, and that created, there was a lot of stress around that. However, we didn't know that for five months when he was getting sicker and sicker, that we were actually dealing with a brain tumor. We thought we were dealing with depression. So those are very different conflicts. And so when you work a conflict, you want to work it, the, the specifics, because specific illness is a specific emotion. 
And so that's why it's best to have a diagnosis so that we can go forward. But we also have to pay attention to how a person felt about that diagnosis. So for instance, if a person gets a cancer diagnosis, they go in and they get the cancer diagnosis, their life, oh my gosh, am I gonna die? Maybe they see themselves in a casket. So we have to ask this question because all of these things can start, maybe that even starts a metastasis of that original cancer. So we pay attention to all of these things. And Dr. Hammer, these five laws, basically that we're like a rocket, like a three-tiered being. We're psyche, automatic brain, and body. And that the spirit, you know, is above that. And spirit has allowed us to, to you know, gives us tools to be able to work through it. We, we, most people have an understanding that forgiveness is important, even though they may not do, be able to forgive, you know, but they have this understanding. Okay, but our psyche, our psyche processes everything, our education, our religion, our culture, you know, are we raised in a, a two family home where we wanted all of these things are processed through our psyche. And as we grow older, you know, and we're experiencing our daily life and our children and, 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 uh, and work and all of these situations our psyche processes all of these and our perception can change the way that we process things also. So when we take things personally, then it's going to be a bigger download to us. But when we learn to sort of take a step back and become more of the objective person, like, you know what, this situation is, is happening, but it's not necessarily about me. If it's triggering me, then maybe I should look at that and, and start to, to take it, take a look at that. Why is it triggering me? What does it remind me of? So these are the things that come up in our psyche and our, our psyche is constantly working to help us to sort of, you know, live our life. And so if we have something that is really stressing us out, it, you know, we say in recall healing, it is the stress of the daily life. And, and it's like the pebble in the shoe that when you, when you, have this pebble in your shoe and you walk long enough, it's going to cause a little abrasion or a blister. Well, that's what happens in our body. If we're processing the same things, if we're seeing the same things, I, I, I don't like this person or they don't like me and, and then, or the world is against me, that's going to create the neural pathways in my brain. Well, the automatic brain is responsible to keep us alive from moment to mo moment. This is our amygdala. This is our archaic brain. And this archaic brain is there to help us to stay alive. So it's processed all of the past events, not just from us, but from our ancestors and the collective. It processes what's going on now in the here and now, and it processes what comes up in the future. And how is it best served to, to help us to stay alive? And so, so when our automatic brain feels threatened, you know, back in, in the caveman days, it was just like we, we wouldn't go hunting at night because a predator could get us. Okay, well, now what is the predator in your life? Where is the secret suffering in your life? Because if you're, if you're spinning your wheels and you can't eat, you can't sleep, and you're ruminating about your problem all the time, the automatic brain is going to take over and say, way too much for you to handle. What is that felt experience? What is that real feeling? So we'll download it according to what's going on with that feeling. And then that can start a, a process where the brain is sort of helping you to, with your body to, to address this problem. And so then we're, we're looking for a solution. There's two ways to find a solution, either a practical solution or a transcendent solution. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. But once a person finds a, tr uh, a, a solution, their body can repair. And this is what Dr. Homer says. This is the law of two phases, that every disease, every illness, every, everything, you know, even a common cold has two phases where there was a stress phase where you were in sympathetic overdrive. You can't eat, you can't sleep, you're ruminating about your problem. And even around Christmas time, oh my gosh, are we going to have enough money? How are we going to put food on the table plus presents? How do we do all of these things? This is the stresses that we're talking about. Okay, and, and so if we don't have a way to process that, our body will take over for us and give us the best solution. 
So however that is, it's depending on, on how we, it, it, it's the tissue layers have to do with how we were formed in our mother's womb. And so, you know, the, the vital organs or, or the protection, if, you know, if my, if my life is being threatened in a real way, or if, if, I, if I don't have protection or I'm not safe or, or somebody's questioning my integrity or if I don't feel worthy or have value, all of these things are going to, to manifest in different aspects, different ways in our body and different tissue layers based on these felt experiences. Okay. And so I know it's, it's, it's a lot to understand in one setting, but it be, it's a beginning. And so it's a work in progress in terms of understanding this where we haven't had connection, you know, where we feel separated. This can be another area that, that impacts our, our body, our skin and, and the ectodermic tissue. So we pay attention. What is the diagnosis? Okay. And where might this person be in their disease process? And so we look at that. Dr. Hammer had a student by the name of Dr. Sabal. And so can we go to the, uh, to the iceberg um, picture, please? Awesome, thank you. So Dr. Sabah, he, he helped to bring forward recall healing in a, in a bigger way as well. And, and Dr. Renault was a student of Dr. Sabah and, and really took it to another level as well. And so has added more of his understanding, more of his expertise and, and to continue to grow on it. But we use this iceberg as an, as an understanding and as an example. And that 10% of why a person has an illness is in their awareness. So when I ask a person, hey, why do you have this? Why do you think you have this? They might say, oh, you know, stress. And, and so, so yes, and then why? And so we sort of keep going with that because the, it's not what we give issue to that goes into our tissues. It's what we haven't said, what we don't speak. There, you know, on Facebook right now, there is a, there's a saying that's going around that says something to the effect, like I'm praying for, for all the people that it's hard to speak and hard to, to say, you know, their truth. Well, if you don't say your truth, that is going to manifest in the body. Okay, so we have to find a way, even if you dance it out, if you express it, if you pound it out with a, a nail and a board, but somehow having peace in our body will allow us to heal or to not get sick. And that, and when we keep it in that way in our psyche, as we're, we're talking about it and we're, we're processing through it, then our automatic brain doesn't have to download it into our body. Then our body doesn't have to take over. But if you're secretly stressing over and over, we have to pay attention to that. So Dr. Sabah says that we need to look at, at our, our own experiences. You know, what has gone on in our life? We call this the project or the, uh, the cycle of autonomy. And, and from zero when we're born to the moment that we leave our home, including food, shelter, and clothing, our brain has recorded that this is the best way to keep you alive because you're still alive. And so the good, the bad, and the indifferent will repeat in the next cycle and the next cycle. So say a person for myself, I, I left my home and became independent, including food, shelter, and clothing at 20 years and five months. So zero to 20 years and five months, everything that happened in that time will then repeat in the next 20 years and five months, the next 20 years and five months, and the next 20 years and five months. So we look, we, we say sometimes a date with destiny. Well, when, when in the first cycle, most of the time, this is our normal. This is what we think is the normal. And so we don't really, we might have a sense that something might not be quite right. We might, we will definitely have pain. There, maybe there's a death in this cycle. And then in the next cycle, there's a death, or maybe there's a divorce, or maybe a loss of a friendship, or, or somebody getting fired. So it repeats here and here and here. And it's repeating here to help us to understand that it didn't just start there. If it's happened once, it's happened more than once. And so we have to look at the pattern. We have to look. And there's the, the, the universe is mathematically equated. 
So there's hundreds of different patterns, but this is one way to help us to understand, oh, wow, if I have a cancer diagnosis here, like for instance, one of my, my patients had a cancer diagnosis in her third cycle. I don't remember exactly the ages, okay? However, she had a melanoma of the eye. The melanoma of the eye is the, this would be created as a shield to protect that person. It's not skin cancer or melanoma. It's a deeper part of the dermis, the, the tissue layer that, and, and where a person might feel soiled or, or hurt or their integrity might be hurt. Then a melanoma can come. And so in this particular case, it came in the eye. Why the eye? Well, at the moment that she was dealing with this, her family had moved into a retirement home that they had on a particular land. And her husband actually didn't know about it. And the family was taking all of their retirement money. She was literally giving it to them. She hated her behavior. She felt like, and she was lying to her husband and she wasn't protecting them. So all of these things, and it came as a shield so she didn't have to see it. And she felt soiled by her behavior, ashamed of what she did. In the previous cycle, okay, directly in link with this particular case of when she gets this, this melanoma of the eye, her husband played Russian roulette with her four times and just would do this. And, and, would, and then at that moment, she, she would see this. She needed to be protected because it was such a big stress. She almost lost her life. And in the, in the previous stress, in the, in, the third, in the first cycle, there was a, a moment with, with her father and, that allowed her to go into a room and be raped by a, a neighbor. So, and nobody stood up for her. No, and everybody heard it in the other room. There was a big party going on. The father saw and allowed it to happen. So it was a shield. She wasn't protected by her father. She couldn't believe that none of her friends stood up for her or none of her family. And so it was all these different things. And so this is the life experiences, our experience of what we've actually experienced in our life. But then we have to drop down a little bit deeper into the waterline. And, and by the way, I often hear people saying, well, I can't really do this work because I don't remember anything. Well, the brain has a way of helping us not remember by like blocking us down. When, when there's a big moment of stress, it's like the brain will stop us from seeing that stress and, and will really download it. It's almost like a wash over our hippocampus so that we don't remember it. But how do we remember it? Through our senses, through our smell, through our sight, through our sound, through, through taste, through, through touching, okay? So, so it's downloaded into our body in a particular way. That's why you can listen to a song and be instantly brought back to that place, to the feeling, because it's about the feeling. So we, we look at, at these, these aspects. And then we, we drop down a little bit deeper into the waterline. And as you do the work, what happens is more comes into the awareness because you're clearing away the clutter, okay? And, and it's like the brain can't remember anything in, in its awareness because there's so much cluttered underneath and we need to clear that away. And so we begin to look at all the different things. And I, I all also hear when my clients have done their paperwork, wow, I forgot to put this on. Well, already it's coming that there's more to come. It's the layers. It's the onion. Okay. And so then we drop a little bit deeper and then we look at the project purpose and the project purpose. And, and there's a bigger picture with the baby. We can go to that picture. The project purpose is the 18 months before a child is born. That's nine months before conception. Uh, and, and so everything that mom and dad have experienced in their life, you know, this goes into the ovum, to the semen, and it, and it programs. It sets up for the child, you know, certain things. So is this a good time? Do mom and dad even know each other? Is it, is it, is it a good time in their life? Are they, are they ready to have a baby? And then when the, the conception happens, did they want to conceive that child? Was the, the child welcomed? Was there any drama in this time? 
because the child will swim in these emotions and these feelings and it will record in the in the baby's brain as as a special memory as a as a as a you know, as a program to begin to live something out, to live this message out. So for instance, one of the people that I, I recently have worked with, he's a, a young man of 27 years old. And when his mom was pregnant with him, his family, his, his grandpa and grandma lost the farm. So this guy is a young guy and he has all of this knowledge about farming. And, and started farming when he was 17 years old, had his, his first farm by the time he was 21, has continued to grow as a solution to help his grandparents of this, this big problem that they had. So, so these kinds of messages happen as we swim in utero. And so we look at the pregnancy itself. Is there drama in the pregnancy, the birth? What is the birth like? And then that whole first year of life, what's going on in that first year of life? This goes into the, the makeup of the baby and they begin to live this out. They've done lots of research, lots of new research is coming out on a daily basis. Really, it's really quite something. But one of the first studies that I read that really uh, excited me was out of the University of Utah where they were doing some studies on mice and, and generational patterns. And, and they found that, that when they, they programmed mice to be afraid of cherry blossoms, that three generations later, those mice were still afraid of cherry blossoms and without being conditioned. And I thought, holy moly, like when we're in this uh, in this arena that our parents, our grandparents, and, and when you talk about Poland, there's a lot of uh, harsh history that, that you've had to deal with, that your ancestors have to deal with, and, and no pun intended, cold, you know, we look, we can even see, you know, what, what is this, um, you know, the snow, and, and did anyone, you know, freeze in, in your family history? This can, this can contribute to extra weight in the next generations, and you know, or this even a, a Holocaust can contribute to people being in that heightened awareness. What they found in, in recent research on, on people that have survived the Holocaust or the Armenian genocide, both of these have been studies. Uh, what they find is that the, the future generations exhibit more symptoms of PTSD than did their ancestors. Well, the brain adapts to help keep the, the next generations alive. How? By keeping them on awareness, by looking at that. And so we look at all of these messages that we've been given, you know, for instance, you know, a personal example is that, you know, in my project purpose, my mother loved the, the Beatles song. And so I got named the Beatles song, Michelle, and she struggled with wanting to uh, commit suicide for much of her life. And, and, and then I realized a couple years ago that, oh my goodness, I, I grew up and I became somebody to help keep people alive, help them walk this journey. Why? Because the message was to help keep my mom alive. She prayed that I'd be a girl. She prayed that I could help her. And, and I was funny and, and she, you know, loved having me around and, and I took care of her. And so there was this, this moment of awareness that, wow. And, and it's really interesting because these messages are ambiguous. They're ambiguous, ambiguous, ambiguous. And then all of a sudden they'll be obvious. Oh my gosh, in my life, I became this, you know, I have an ancestor, you know, like doctors, there's, there's there maybe somebody that died from above them or, you know, like a, I have an OBGYN that, that I have worked with. And in the previous generation, somebody died at childbirth. So, so it programmed a doctor to help with these situations. And so we look at the, the project purpose this, this time. And then if you wanna drop down a little bit deeper into the waterline, we look at the generational patterns, which is on the next page. And this come, came from a woman by the name of Ann Schutzenberger who wrote a, a great book on the ancestral syndrome and the generational patterns. And, and she was a woman that she would, and I'm not sure she's still doing therapy. She's, she's, uh, she's increasing in age, so I'm not sure if she's still doing it, but it's, it's, she's really um, a pioneer to, to help us to understand that these patterns 
that there are these patterns, okay? And that what she began to understand is when she would do a person's family tree, she would see that there was patterns, you know, that children with birth order numbers one, two, and three, that they would be separated from each other. But when you'd see them from above, there would be these patterns that, that happened with the one, four, seven, she called it the magic square. Um, but it's really about the law of numbers and that, that the universe is very well organized and numbers can help us. And so when we see, you know, and miscarriages, abortions matter. And so for the ancestral syndrome, for, for the things that you carry as an invisible loyalty, it's not what is in our awareness that, that we carry on. It's what's not in our awareness. And even if you've been adopted, my mother was adopted, and, and in the last five years, we found out all kinds of information that we didn't have any knowledge of before. And so you still have the opportunity. And we work, if you're adopted, you work down. So now my mother has, there's four generations. There's us, there's her, her children, and now there's grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So everything that's going on in the family tree right now gives us insight as to what has happened from above us as well. So you're never at a loss. There's always a place for you to be able to to recognize and to understand, oh, wow, there is this pattern. Or, you know, one, you know, one child carries something and looks very much, oh, they have a depression. Oh, they, their uncle had a depression. Or their aunt with the same birth order number or in the same row. So, so children one, two, and three are separated. But as you go four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, it's literally the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So one, four, seven, it's a vertical pattern, two, five, eight, three, six, nine, and so forth. And so this is how it sort of unfolds. And, and when you look at it and you see, then you can make more connections and break these, uh, the unfinished business of the family. So, so that is really our core, our, our basic foundation. And whenever I work with someone, we always consider What's the, the stress? What's going on right now? What's, what's gone on in the life experiences? What's gone on in the project purpose? What's gone on in the ancestor syndrome? Also, if you're named for somebody, um, it's like having their unfinished business that the person is carrying out to help them. So I recently had a woman whose uncle, great uncle, had, had uh, died in World War II. And so, and then her son was named for this uncle and had, um, had been missing for eight months. Well, the, the uncle had been missing for eight months. And so when you're named for somebody, you can carry these patterns out without even having an understanding that that's what's happening. And so we look, you know, who are you named for? What do you carry for the unfinished business? And then, and then we would apply the letting go tools, which we'll talk about in, in a little bit. So any questions so far? Uh, I'm looking at the chat window now and I don't see any questions yet. Okay. Okay, perfect. But, um, well, thanks anyway for getting uh, for giving us such a detailed description in such a logical way. Uh, it was really well constructed. And uh, I've just remembered referring to what you've said about the um, diagnosis. What the Deepak Chopra once said that we need the diagnosis, but we shouldn't believe the prognosis. Absolutely. That's such a great thing to say. And, and with, sometimes we have to say, well, you know, that person is not God. They have no idea when you're going to die. You can welcome this cancer or this diagnosis because it's an invitation to change up what is not working. Because obviously some, your brain said, hey, you need this in order to do this. And, and I love the work of Dr. Joe Dispenza. And, and he said, in a recent lecture that I, I heard that, that we can't be the same person that created a cancer to, let, to allow the cancer to leave. We have to, be a, that, we have to be a different person. And he gave some examples about how a person can 
really begin to imagine like, okay, if I have a tumor, if I have a certain manifestation, why do I have that? Why is that the best solution? What is that tumor trying to speak to me? What is it saying? And if you have a basic understanding about the body and the body part, what in biology is used, you know, for that, for instance, the bladder and marking the territory, if I need to mark my territory, my kids sit in my chair over and over and over again. Hey, that's my territory. Mm -hmm. So if we can't pee on our territory, we have to speak our truth. So if we can't, then we have to find a way. So, so that's just, you know, a little yeah, example. But that's always awesome. helping us. Exactly. Be we we right. listen. Mm -hmm. So. And this factor, which very often stops a person from healing is fear. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we like to look at it this way because fear is, you know, if we also consider fear has kept us alive, okay, it will help us to pay attention to the danger. There's an appropriate place for fear. So, but we can ask the question, what is the worst thing that can happen? What is the worst thing that can happen? And then we, we have to keep sort of looking at like, well, what's the worst thing that can happen? Yes, there can be pain and there can be suffering. So, so let me, instead of focusing on the diagnosis, because whatever we focus on tends to grow, we focus on why we have this. It takes away some of the fear. Why? What is this body? What is the biology speaking? Okay. And then instead of ignoring our, our fear, Breathe into it. Thank the fear for showing up because it's going to keep you on the path to keep going. Take a breath, take a step back, and, and really begin to put ourselves back into this place. That will help address some of the fear. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's very difficult for many people to understand that they are responsible for their own healing. Yeah, most people are, well, I wouldn't say most people, many people are still looking for the magic bullet. And there is no such thing as a magic bullet. And really, there's no one size fits all type of medicine either. And sometimes recall healing doesn't resonate with people, or maybe they're not ready for it. And, you know, it, it all works together. And, and it really is just some basic tools that help us to live. And, and so when people, you know, say this is not for me, I say, okay, and wish them well, because I, I pray that they'll come to that place that whatever they find will help them to keep going. And that's the thing, we use whatever we can to keep going. Yes, and uh, there's one more thing I think we should explain, because very often people think that recall healing stands in opposition to uh, conventional medicine. Uh, right. medicine. And right. Absolutely not. We do not interfere with any, any medicine at all. And we, you know, that person, we don't interfere with their treatment. We help the person to understand why the, why the cancer came so that everything that they do in their, in their treatment program will work better. That's the thing. What you're doing is you're removing the energetic blocks and the stagnation and the, and the unhealthy ways of being in the world, okay? And then all the things, the food, the it, Western medicine, if you use Western medicine, whatever is, is that person doing, we never interfere. So, so it, and recall healing always complements wherever a person is in their journey. And you also spoke about some interesting um techniques which you've mentioned uh, when we were talking before the emotion screening yes uh, so you've mentioned some letting go exercises mm -hmm. so the letting go exercises uh are it's just our basic way of helping a person to sort of um move through let me pull up my own so that i can uh have the same ones that you guys have on this uh these, the letting go exercises just allow us to, to go, go through and, and be able to process things in a way that um, 
that we can have actually some peace about them. Okay. And so, so in, in recall healing, we use the Ho'oponopono and the Ho'oponopono comes from indigenous Hawaii and, and it literally means to make right or to cleanse. Um, and so whatever shows up in, in our life, it might not be our fault, but if we take a hundred percent responsibility for whatever it is, then we can offer healing in a way that, that oftentimes there wasn't any healing. And the way I envision it, it's like we're on a, on a meadow or in the mountains and, and on a road uh, where there's all these blocks and it's super dark and the trees and there's boulders all along the path. And, and you don't, you're, you keep, you know, bumping into these and, and it's almost like you're walking into a, um, a spider web and, and it feels so nasty. You know, when you walk into the spider web, it's sticky and you're sort of in the thick of it. And so the whole ponopono uh, can what it does is it, it takes wherever this began you know if we have an understanding where it actually be began that's really wonderful but if we don't and we just simply say gosh for whatever I carry whatever might contribute to this I'm sorry please forgive me I love you thank you you begin to to cleanse whatever you're carrying whatever reason and and you know it's sort of like that law of attraction where things continue to show up if if one time we've been a victim then we can be victimized a lot in our life well in order to shift this kind of thing and shift our perspective about it we can begin to apply the whole ponopono you can you can also imagine your little girl or little boy self within you that's had to experience these things and you and you can say that to them i'm sorry please forgive me i love you thank you for what you're experiencing and dr hugh lynn is the person that really made this uh um popular in in our era and he's helped lots of people, you know, and, and even by not even seeing them personally. And where he would take their folder, he would look to see what had been done to them and what had, you know, in a, in a prison situation and what they had done to other people. And he knew that when a person gets cornered, that they can behave in a less than desirable way. We all have survival that, you know, there's that fight or flight. Sometimes we are put in a place of fighting and, and that can cause things. And so he looked inside himself and he began to say, you know, for whatever's in me that might cause this to show up, please forgive me. I love you. Thank you. And one by one, those patients that he was working with started to heal. And so I have many examples and I've spoken about them on some of the webinars that I've done, but it's just time and time again, I see how much this, this changes it. And, and so that imagining that, that path in the forest where all these trees and it's dark and you start to hit these boulders. Well, when you do the whole ponopono, it clears away some of the boulders, the light begins to show or the moon so that you can actually bring into consciousness what has been causing these things. And so I love the whole ponopono. It really is a way of life, a, a, a way to begin to live in a way that, um, that it, I, I don't know exactly what it does, but it, it changes hearts and, and certainly perspectives. And, and, um, and you know, I, I look at it like as if we're going to the mountaintop and we're addressing the, the pain of our families, the pain of what we're experiencing, the pain of the other people, the woundedness of the other people. And it's not your fault, but when you're willing to offer it and say, gosh, you're so wounded, you can't even do this work for yourself. So let me help by offering love and forgiveness and compassion and gratefulness for you showing up in my life. And, and see what happens when you begin to apply that, that tool. There's another one called the Walker from Reno where we put our hands over our heart and we say, my heart is full of love and understanding. And, you know, if we're struggling with somebody, you could say their heart is full of love and understanding. Again, 
love heals all. And, and this is going to be one of the, my first book when I pull it out. Uh, when, I, when I finally uh, publish it, it will be, you know, love heals all. And, and the reason is, is that when we offer anger and hatred, that, that's actually what grows. But when we offer love and forgiveness, that is what grows. And a lot of times people, including ourselves, don't de deserve forgiveness, but mercy is a beautiful thing. And mercy, you know, this is when somebody doesn't for deserve to be forgiven, and yet you forgive them to help you and to help them. And so my heart is full of love and understanding. And, you know, you just think of that person that might cause you some stress or in your life that, you know, that, that is the pebble in your shoe perhaps. And, and so we look at this and, and uh, it came about from a, a guy that was in, he had gotten picked up uh, for, he had felt called to go for this walk and he, he goes for a walk and the police think that he's, he's, uh, he's crazy because he doesn't have any shoes on. He's walking in Reno. And, and so he, he ends up getting uh, arrested, you know, because they think he's drunk or crazy or something and, and, and put him in jail. Well, this other guy comes in and, and in California and, and Nevada, there's a, a strike three rule. The guy comes in and he's like, oh my gosh, I, I can't believe it. I'm, I did a strike three. I'm not even sure why I did it. And I'm just going to get the book thrown at me. This is, this is it. It's going to be really bad. And so the walker from Reno was there and he said, well, let's just try to meditate. And the guy's like, really, you're going to do that in this case, you know? And then he's like, what do you have to lose? And so they did it. My heart is full of love and understanding. My heart is full of love and understanding. And they did it for about 20 minutes. And then the guy said, gosh, you know, I do feel better. Thank you so much. And I, you know, like, wow, that's great. And then, then the walker says, well, now let's do it for the judge. And he said, what? We're going to do it for the judge? No way. And he said, what do you have to lose? So he said, okay. So he did it for the judge. The next day he walked into court and the judge came in and she said, you know, I don't know why, but I feel like you need another chance. So let me go ahead and give you that chance. But if I see you again, you know, that's going to be it. And so he really changed his life around, became a motivational speaker. And, you know, I've, I've heard people use this with their family, with their bosses, you know, one particular instance where a guy was, was, um, he had been with his boss. They had worked together for 10 years, but the guy had just recently become his boss. And so he started treating him very poorly. And, and so I shared with him, why don't you do this? And so about three months later, he came back to me and he said, you know that thing, my heart is full of love and understanding. And I said, yes. And he said, well, it really works. My boss is being really nice to me. And he offered me tickets to go to a place. And so all these kinds of things can transform. It's about the energy. You're moving the energy with love. Dr. Emoto was a guy that, that did um, some research around water and, um, and different sources of water and different areas of, in the world. And, and when he would, he would take beautiful sourced water and he would, he would freeze it and, and it would look beautiful like, like snowflakes. And then he would take it from uh, polluted and, and really gross places and, and, and it would be just smudged and, and yuck and the structure would be gross. And then he would put words on it of, of love and forgiveness. And it began to change the structure of the waters. And so that can happen with our blood as well. They, they've done some more recent research with our blood to, to know that if you start to put love and forgiveness and gratitude within our blood, a compassion, empathy, then our blood will flow better. It's, it's pretty amazing. And our body is made of 80% water. So we are moving. We are, we are dynamic. We're not in one space. And we always want to keep growing so that we can keep going. So, and, and vice versa. We keep going so that we can keep growing. And then we do a little technique called the butterfly hug. The butterfly hug um, is sort of a cross between um, 
the EMF technique of emotional freedom technique and, and some affirmations bringing in. And, and then when we tap, we anchor what we say into our body. And the butterfly, you know, is transformational. It's, it's representation of transformation, of, of dying unto our old self so that we can be reborn into uh, something else and into a new way of living a new way of being in this life and so we we might say something like even if i'm angry at so and so i love and accept myself and 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 put in yourself there a lot even if i'm angry with myself i love and accept myself i forgive myself from the bottom of my heart because i'm doing the best i can with the resources that i have and I no longer have to carry this in my body. I don't have to die for this. I choose to let this go so that I can live my life to the fullest. And I say, take a deep cleansing breath and then release. Okay, we carry the judgment that we judge ourselves, the judgment from others, we carry this. And so by doing these kinds of techniques, we allow ourselves to sort of walk through them, to release them. We use Marianne Williamson's prayer. Um, we use Byron Katie's work. Um, we use a lot of different techniques. And many, many people that I have seen have done many years of, of transformational work. So I never interfere with what they've done, but I'll add some tools to their toolbox. You know, and, and really 100% is about changing the perspective because when we change the perspective, we change the reality and, and we really can heal and we can grow and keep going. Finally, we, we look at the, the, we'll look at the small property today. And the small property comes from Dr. Sabah and our brain speaks in symbolic language. And, and I, I think I failed to, to mention that. But our problems can be real, imaginary, symbolic, virtual. When you're seeing a movie and you're, you're brought right into that experience, it's, it's for your body. It's as if it's really happening. You know? So we have to pay attention to what is going on symbolically, virtually, literally, okay? That what is, um, whatever I'm feeling and where does it line up in my timeline, in my project purpose and, and with my ancestors. And so the small property speaks to this. It says, I was a small property ravaged by the storm. So all of us are coming in with all of this history and you're that little baby that's come into this world, but now the fine weather has returned. You don't have to carry that unfinished business. We can name it, we can claim it, we can dump it. We can break those invisible loyalties and we can begin to move on. We can breathe in our life. It, it gives us freer choice, free, you know, free will. The forest and river have become calm. The forest is our ancestors and the river is our mom. The house is vibrant and shines in the sun. The house is our body and it shines under the divine light of, of God or the divine. Uh, the sun is also symbolic of the father. Above all, the field is returning to its order, health, and beauty. The field is our body, okay? And, and it did whatever we have, whatever manifestation. For me, it was weight, you know, 100 pounds, 50 uh, kilograms bigger than, than I, I am today. And it was because of, of protection. It was, I felt alone, and, and um, I felt like I didn't have that support. So thank you to my disease organs. Thank you to my body for what you have done to save my life. And thank you to myself for doing my healing work. And so when we do our healing work, not only do we heal, but everyone heals. And, and so it's, it's a great way of really focusing on ourselves, taking responsibility for ourselves, and healing ourselves and our families. So... So that's it uh, as far as the, the tools that we use. And, and so we can now, we can ans ask, answer some questions or I can move on and talk a little bit about, about brain issues. Yes, we, we actually have some questions appeared in the chat window. Um, uh, many people ask about the slides, will they be available? And uh, I just wanted to mention that there will be a video of this webinar since it's free available on Facebook uh, of Mind, Body, Spirit, Campiel. And uh, one person asked, I'm not sure if you can see it, 
uh, it's from Mandy. Uh, how can we deal with the pain in the healing phase? It is sometimes unbearable. So that, so yes, so pain, physical pain is that uh, physical pain can be addressed with with meditation, with breathing techniques, with seeing yourself turning down pain and um, also accessing joyful places because it, as soon as you access a place of joy, it will stop the pain because it's different functions of the body. Very challenging to get yourself out of that place. And, you know, it's like I said, it's not easy. I get that. And it can be done. And so, so breathing techniques, breathing is so key. You know, it's key to life, obviously, but it's key to our healing as well. And then in terms of emotional pain, one step at a time, understand that in working with emotional pain, it comes like waves. Think about, I don't know how many people have been to the ocean, but generally speaking, there's a set of waves that comes. There's a little wave and then there's a little break in between and then there's a little bigger wave and then there's a break in between and then there's a big wave, but always they do, they crash, okay? They, they end and so know that you're in it, it's just a moment in time it's one day at a time, sometimes it's one second at a time, and to breathe through that experience and, and you'll get there. It's not going to be this way forever. It hasn't been this way forever. And so you can count on it shifting. All right, thank you. And uh, I hope it answers your question, Mandy. Yes. Uh, do we have any? So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I apologize. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think we have uh, any other questions at the moment. Um, so uh, you know that um, I finished recall healing and training myself and that happened due to a person very close to my heart had brain tumor. So I wanted dis to discover what stood behind it, what was the reason, what was the root. And I know that you have a similar personal story uh, with your grandson who had a brain tumor. So uh, sure. if you could tell us about it, that would be really Sure. So there's many aspects of brain tumor. We, we would want to know where brain tumor is, the type of tissue that it is, because it helps us to uncover um, the, the, the bigger or the underlying meaning. Um, however, in a general sense, we look at the, the waist up as the father. So we would look at the head in relationship to our, our father on earth okay, or the divine, and also intellectual issues. So for instance, I had a guy that had a brain tumor and he didn't actually, his father actually left the family and had a whole nother family in another place. And he never understood where the father went, just abandoned the family, okay? He joins the military, he joins the, the air force and the air is in link with the father as well you know, in the, in the connection. And, and then he was fired from uh, 25 years and it was an unjust firing. And so he, it was really hard for him. He couldn't figure out. He, here he had this issue with authority, with the father, with his own personal father, also the authority in the air force. And, and so he, and the injustice of it for him was just so challenging. And, and also he didn't feel like he had the intelligence to make it through. And there was many times in his life where he didn't know if he was going to make it through to the next level. And he was a pilot and, and all of these things also contributed to that. But once he began to understand it, come to peace, he had a glioblastoma, which would come in a repair phase. Okay, he, it, that, that means that, that it would come at the end of the conflict. The conflict was over. He had been released a couple of years ago. He was, he was actually coming to peace with it. Certain things had calmed down. He actually had a good talk with his father. Okay, and, and that helped to allow him to go into repair. It was a serious issue. That's why it was a serious uh, undertaking of his body to repair. 
And so that's that process. And so that's one story that, that you know, it, it sticks out. And so we look at the type of tumor, where it is, um, and, and the experiences of the individual. My grandson, you know, and we also know that there's also life experience. We have the project purpose, and then we have the ancestors, okay? And, and there, was, there was every little thing with my grandson. And so it was really amazing once we began to see it. And so he, he they had the family, my, my oldest son moved their the family to um, Minnesota. Nobody was there. None of the family was there. They were, they were there. Um, and, and basically by themselves, although there was a cousin of, of my daughter-in-law's that had been there. And before they had Adam, um, they, they weren't married and there, there was, there was some drama. And, and, and so my, my son was, was, um, you know, was threatened and this threatening is, is like, if it, if, if it's download and threatened with their life there, if it's a download in the head, okay, it's like a download for the, the father, my son, but it, the aftershock or the shock waves, when a child is dependent on the parents, if that if if my son is not there to protect the family and feed the family then technically speaking that child could die so the children will always take on the unfinished business the psychological suffering of the parents can become the biological suffering of the children and so there was all this stuff in his project purpose and then in his young little life they moved and so he was sad that he was away from his friends and and then the new kids in in minnesota were were not treating him very nicely and he felt bullied well this was a brain tumor in the cerebellum okay so protection and so my son wasn't protected he felt unprotected and then and so this happened well the person that that had um threatened my son suddenly died and two weeks after he had died, so for the brain, the brain doesn't know anything but symbolism and liter literally. So now this guy is not here anymore to threaten my son's life, you know, lit literally and figuratively. And so once that happens, the brain can release that energy and my grandson doesn't have to carry it. And it's based on his experience, his project purpose and the ancestors. So I always say that because this is the, the pattern that repeats. And so once we began to understand, oh, you know, that, and I needed help because when we're in our own little, um, our own secret suffering, our own trauma, the things we thought that, that my grandson was depressed from being away. That's why we need to have a diagnosis because when you don't have a diagnosis, you're not working on the right thing. So it took five months to understand that he had a brain tumor and not depression. And once we did, and my, and my mentor, Gilbert, he, he said, Michelle, remember that your son was threatened. Oh my goodness, that's right. He was threatened and then this guy dies. And so now Adam can be released from that. And so, and, and you know, we talked a little bit earlier about Western medicine. Well, thank God for Western medicine because they, my grandson's, he was in a, a very serious state and the, the brain tumor was a baseball size, was putting pressure on his brainstem. And so if that wasn't removed at that moment, he, he may have died. And so, so we use everything. But the most beautiful thing is when, uh, when Dr. Renault had said, Michelle, remember about this, I called my daughter-in-law, my daughter-in-law talked to my son, my son-in-law, my son talked to my grandson's picture, not his person, okay, his picture, it's about the energy, but you get in touch with that felt experience so that it can, it can heal. And so he did a couple hours later after he had done this, oh, honey, you don't have to carry this. This was my problem. Daddy resolved this issue. You're great, babe. And you can do what you need to do in your life. I release you from this. And those are some simple techniques that you can do. And so Adam, two hours later, was jumping around. His facial features had changed. He was, had color. It was so beautiful to see 
it happening right before my eyes. And, and that combined with what I had learned in my PhD, I had taught my grandson some breathing techniques and his mama was so beautiful because she did these breathing techniques with him as he was healing of his surgery. And, and he began to learn how to do these breathing techniques to walk through different issues in his life. And so he's doing great. It's two and a half years later. Um, and it's, you know, it's a really beautiful story. And to be able to, to, to have seen it personally in a very serious way. And um, it's touched my life. And, and so I enjoy telling people about it and, and letting them know that there's, there's hope, you know, that there's always hope. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for this explanation. And it's actually really great that you were able to help uh, this little guy. And through healing one person, through healing a child, you've healed the whole tree, the whole family right. got released from some trauma. Uh, we actually have one more question. It's sure. From, can, you, uh, can you read it? It's from Angela Johnson in the chat. Uh -huh. um, I, let me see. I'm not... That's all right. So I can read it for you. It's how do you determine a child's number in a blended family? We have four children. One and two are mine from a previous relationship. Three and four are ours together. And our youngest daughter was recently diagnosed with leukemia. Uh, she's my fifth biological child. First okay. being a miscarriage. Okay. And she's her father's third child. His first being an abortion. Would she have two sets of numbers for both sides? Yes, you do. That's a great question. Thank you for that. And I'm sorry about the diagnosis. It's, uh, it's you know, that's hard to have a diagnosis and, and to understand, okay, when we look at, at leukemia, we look at not being able to protect the family. So, so where, so does she carry mommy and daddy's issue from above? You know, does she, where, you know, oftentimes they do. And who else does she line up with? You absolutely, miscarriages and abortions do count. So you, she'll have a number for her father's side. Okay, so I think you said that, that she was number three. If that includes the miscarriage or the abortion, Okay, if it does not include the abortion, you need to include the abortion. And then she would be number four, which she would then line up with that abortion. So how does daddy feel? What's going on? And, you know, we have to look at biology. In biology, most species of, of animals do not kill their babies. So we don't, it's beyond the, whether it's right or wrong but we need to do some work around it. Make sure that you're at peace about it. I would give honor to that. And to understand there's probably a program from above that you may not have been wanted. And, and so you carry it out as an invisible loyalty. So I know that that was a lot, but you know, in terms of you definitely wanna know about what number that child lines up with on both mom's side and dad's side, and then use the number for mom's side to look at all the ancestors and use the number for dad to look at all the ancestors and look at the underlying places where either she or the other people couldn't protect their family. When we talk about leukemia, we talk about blood. So the protection uh, feeling and also feeling devalued, we look at this as well. So I hope that was helpful. Right, thank you, Angela, and thank you, Michelle. Uh, I don't see any other questions at the moment, but I know that uh, before we started the webinar, you've mentioned, you've mentioned that you're planning to release a book. Yes, I am. So uh, it I'm got- really looking forward. <laughs> sure. Um, so the name of the book will be called From the Root to the Fruit and Everything in Between, Love Heals All. And basically it's showing that when we put love to all the situations, when we offer love and forgiveness, then, then many things open up. And so love of ourself, okay, and, and love of of our family and to clear away. Sometimes we can't hang out with our family because they're not very, they're not very healthy for us. 
And, and so that it's okay, you know, that if they're not healthy for us, this is one of my websites, the, the soul tree transformations. However, it's also in link with recall healing USA, uh, dot com and also recall healing international. Um, these, these are the ways I'm, I'm actually more aligned with Dr. Renault now. And so, um, so it's, it's lovely. Um, so the book, it will have stories about um, different people that have done some really amazing healing with their families, talking about ancestor syndrome, talking about the project purpose and the issues that come out in project purpose. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my dissertation research, just basically about the themes that, um, that have come, which, which are amazing, that we have an understanding that the body, that the mind, that the spirit all contributes, you know, that, that we have power, you know, before we didn't understand that we had power, um, that we have the ability to help our families to heal that we use everything that we can, but that there are absolutely ancestral connections of, of our secret suffering as well. And so we have to pay attention to all of that. And so that's what's coming in the book. And, um, and so I'm excited and, and I started it and then I took a little bit of a, a break this year. And so I'm getting back to it and, and it should come out sometime next year. Oh, yes. I wanted to mention uh, your website and the Thank Recall you. Healing Group as well. So yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we're just connected telepathic. Perfectly. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So now we have, um, just to remind you, we have now the links to both sites on, in the chat window to all the attendees. And uh, we have another question from uh, Mags. Could you please explain a bit a migraine background? How can I help myself? How to understand that sickness? Uh, I've been suffering for 20 years and I can't understand. So, so a couple things with, with migraine. Migraine tends to, again, it's about the fi father. And so we might have some regrets about our father being our father. We had one person that had migraines for 25 years and she would get the migraine on the same day every, every year or every month, sorry. And, and so she sort of flippantly said, you know, what, is, what, what can that be about? And, and, I, and I said, well, it could be a regret for your father. And about five minutes later, she went out of the class really crying and realized that on the day that she has her, her migraines or that she had her migraines was the day that her father told her mother that he was having an affair for 25 years. And so she loved her dad, but for that, she regretted that he was her father. And then she had a husband that cheated on her as well. And so it was a sort of a repeat of that same pattern. So I would say, what's the relationship like with you and your father? What's the relationship like from the people that are above you? Who do you line up with? What's the story with your father? And, and when, you know, when you name it, claim it, then you can dump it. The woman's migraines went away. And so um, if you're triggered, then you can ask, well, what, what just happened that would contribute to me having a migraine? Do I feel, you know, this way? It might be oftentimes when we have um, a stress release, we can just get a, a headache. At the end of a hard day, we can have a headache. Those are different than migraines because one is repair phase, one is in a, a pattern of, of this emotional suffering related to the father. Right, and um, there is one more from Mandy. Uh, I think it's about, oh, she writes that your knowledge is amazing and so vast. Thank you. Asks, how do you diagnose, I think, a cause of a child that medicine has problems to diagnose could be allergic? Um, so that's challenging, especially when, um, so allergies typically are about a separation story and, and so the original separation story. So let's say for instance, somebody, um, hears some bad news when they're pregnant, you know, and they're eating Italian food and then the child grows up and is allergic to some Italian food. Okay. 
So there could be something like that. Um, so, but a diagnosis is important. And yet I know that uh, it can be challenging for certain things. And so in that case, until we had a diagnosis, we would look at the symptoms, but we do really like to have a diagnosis. Right. Oh, all right. So I guess this is it. Okay. Thank you so much, Michelle, for yes. this broad uh, background of what we call healing is. And my, <laughs> definitely, it's definitely been my pleasure. Thank you're you so actually much. You're amazing. You're so logical, you, and you make it all so clear, and you're so convincing with it. <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. It's, it's been it's so great, and and I I do obviously love what I do, and I've gotten to see so many amazing stories and I really believe that this is my purpose and you know um and just helping people to to walk through their healing journeys and I'm not a healer I, I consider myself an educator and so just walking with people they get to do their own healing and and use whatever they, they can and so it's an honor to be with you guys again and I appreciate what you're doing and any way that I can be with you to collaborate I, I'm happy to do that. That's brilliant. Thank you so much again. Thank you for sharing a lot of your energy. And uh, so we're going to leave all the links to Michelle's website, uh, to the Recall Healing USA group. Uh, you can also follow us uh, on Facebook, on Instagram. And uh, we also have the last episode of podcast with Jonathan Fitzler for you. Uh, awesome. So you can listen to this as well. So cool. And we'll be really grateful for, for some feedback from you. Uh, the video from this webinar will be placed on Facebook so you can come back to it. Uh, if, if you have any questions, you can leave them in the comments. Uh, you can leave them in Polish. So uh, yeah, I can translate or I can uh, I can tell you uh, also a little bit from Miracle Healing myself. So okay. thank you very much again. Thank you, Camila, very much. I'll talk to you next time. So all the best to you. I'm looking forward to your book. Thank you. Me too. I will. I'll make sure that I, I'll I'll get you a copy when I'm finished with it. Oh, that's so kind. <laughs> so best wishes to you. Thank you, and good night, everyone. Thank you for attending the webinar. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.